All right, exam two, let's begin. Uh, so this is your question. I won't go over it uh, because you asked it, but I will highlight some key points. Um, so first of all, it's a washer, so we're looking at a circular surface. Um, it's going to be insulated along the flat side, so we aren't going to have any heat transfer along um, the surface area. Uh, the dowel on the inside keeps it at zero degrees Celsius. And then our outer radius of beta is going to be 15 degrees on the top and negative 15 degrees on the bottom here. Uh, it has a diffusivity of one centimeter squared per second, so that will affect how fast the heat transfers. And then we also want to point out the fact that you said you are only interested in long-term behavior. So we are not concerned about the initial temperature as that will not play an effect in the long-term behavior. Uh, so what we're looking at here again is heat transfer. Like last time, uh, we said it was a partial derivative of the heat with respect to time was equal to two partial derivatives of heat with respect to space. Uh, here we're saying the same thing, but because we're in two dimensions, we are using a, a differential operator to the second degree. Um, so it's, it's taking two derivatives with respect to space. So when we're looking at this, like we said, it's two derivatives with respect to space, um, but in this case, we're dealing with a circular shape. So we need to use polar coordinates instead. Uh, what that's going to give us is an equation here um, where we're looking at one derivative with respect to time is equal to the diffusivity, two derivatives with respect to the radius, one over r times one derivative with respect to the radius, and, and also, by the way, these are partial derivatives, and then one divided by r squared times the heat with respect to the angle that it is at. And then once again here, our, um, the radius r, angle theta, and time t. So you said you were only interested in long term, which means there are a few adjustments we can make on our equation. First of all, the partial derivative with respect to t in the long term is zero because it's not changing with respect to time. Therefore, the left side of our PDE is going to be zero. And then secondly, you said that it had a diffusivity, uh, but we aren't concerned about how fast or slow the diffusivity is because that is dependent on time. And so um, we can just ignore the diffusivity because we're only looking for long-term behavior. So that simplifies our equation down to this right here. Now boundary conditions. So we have the PDE set up. Let's look at what kind of uh, boundary conditions we're going to be at. So our heat is only dependent on the radius and the angle that it's at. Um, we said that there is a dowel of one centimeter and it keeps the center at zero degrees Celsius. So anything from one centimeter at any angle is going to be zero. It's going to have no temperature, and then the outer radius is going to be hotter, and the inner or the excuse me, the top outer radius is hotter, the bottom outer radius is colder, and so we've got this u of beta theta equals f of theta, so it's only dependent on theta, where the top half again is 15 degrees, and the bottom half is negative 15, which I denote with the red and blue for hot and cold. And then what about theta? How can we uh, create boundary conditions for theta. Well, um, the location of negative pi and pi here on a circle is actually the same location. So we can just say that whatever the heat is at pi has to be the heat at negative pi, and whatever the change in heat with respect to the angle is at pi also has to be the same for negative pi. Just because this is the same location, if you were to go around the circle, starting at negative pi and going to pi, you'd end up in the exact same place there. So what we have so far, this is our PDE. We've got uh, these spatial derivatives set equal to zero. We've got our boundary conditions two have to relate to any theta value and a spe uh, specified radius. And then here we have um, specified radius, but a determined value for theta being pi and negative pi. So we want to use separation of variables. We used this in our last equation as well, our last problem. And we'd want to split it up into a function of the radius and a function of theta. 
Uh, but in order to do this, we need our PDE and our boundary conditions to be linear and homogeneous. So, is our PDE linear and homogeneous? Yes, because it's clearly just addition of the uh, partial derivatives and then homogeneous because the left side is zero. Next, our boundary conditions are uh, mostly linear and homogeneous. We see that uh, the radius, or at radius one, the temperature is zero, and at uh, pi and negative pi, they are equal. Well, if we rearrange that, we actually find that pi minus um, the heat at pi minus the heat at negative pi is zero. Same thing with the derivative, it's equal to zero. So in order to be homogeneous, it's not that they have, it's a, the linear combination is equal to zero. So this is clearly a linear combination, it's equal to zero, so that's fine. Um, so these three conditions are great. What about u of beta theta is this piecewise function? Well, that's not so ideal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna ignore it. We're gonna look back at it later when we need an initial condition and we're trying to solve for some uh, coefficients. So this means that the other ones uh, give us linear and homogeneous PDE and boundary conditions so we can use separation of variables. That is, our heat is some function just based on the radius and some function just based on the angle. And then we, we did this uh, last time with our uh, transient solution. Um, so this should seem familiar. We split it into a uh, partial derivative or a second partial derivative with the radius. And we get um, two derivatives here, one derivative, derivative there, two there. Um, a lot of math. Essentially, it just gets down to setting it equal to a constant lambda, and we then have two equations, one that is t only and one that is r only. So we're going to solve the t only equation first. Uh, this one should be fairly familiar as we have, we did do something similar in the last time as well. Um, and just for simplicity, I'm going to use t for theta uh, for now, um, just because it made it easier for our typing purposes. So we guess that t is equal to e times a constant times t or what would have been theta, um, we solve that r has to be plus or minus negative lambda. So then depending on what the value of lambda is, it'll determine what our solution for t looks like. So less than zero, we have uh, real roots. So you just get something simple like that. Lambda equals zero, we got uh, c1 plus c2t. And then if lambda is greater than zero, we have complex. So this is gonna turn it into cosines and sines. And then for boundary conditions, we had u of r pi equals u of r common negative pi. Um, we can just look at the uh, the pi part. Assuming that r is not zero, we can divide by r from both sides and find that t of pi equals t of negative pi. And so then we've got um, the same thing, t prime of pi is equal to t prime of negative pi. So there's going to be a lot of math here. Uh, you can pause the video and look at it if you're interested but I'm just going to go through and explain what the solutions are for each case. So the case where lambda is less than zero, that is real roots, we end up with the trivial solution. Uh, so that's not interesting. It is a solution, but it's not very helpful. It's not gonna help us understand the long-term behavior, so we will ignore it. And then for case two, where lambda equals zero, uh, we have t of pi equals t of negative pi, and in putting that into our equation, we, have, we can subtract the C1s out, and we've got C2, uh, pi plus pi equals zero. Dividing by pi plus pi, you've got C2 equals zero. And then when we take the derivative, it gets rid of the T, so we're left with just C1. And so then um, or we get rid of the T, and T C1 goes away too because the derivative takes it out. We've got just C2 on one side, C2 on the other, and we already know C2 equals zero but we haven't found anything about C1. So C1 um, is a solution. That is, we can say that if lambda equals zero, our solution is just one or some constant. And then in the case where lambda is greater than zero, we're going to have complex roots. Uh, so again, it's a lot of math. I wouldn't worry too much. If you want to look back at it, um, feel free to pause the video. But what this is going to end up giving us 
is the case where uh, sine of lambda pi needs to be zero. If lambda pi needs to be zero, then we need square root of lambda to equal n. And so squaring both sides, we've got lambda n equals n squared, which is one, and, and n is going to be some natural number. So one, two, three, and so on. This gives us eigenvalues of n squared with n one, two, three. And then um, one thing to notice is that both c1 and c2 are not equal to zero. Neither of them had to be that this solution uh, of lambda being n squared actually allows both c1 and c2 to remain. So we have here a cosine option or a sine option. T is only considered as the, we were considering it as a superposition um, that is adding both the cosine and sine together, but we can actually get individual sine or cosine options. So when lambda is less than zero, it's trivial, it's not important. When lambda is greater than zero, we have lambda n equals n squared, and uh, we have n from zero to infinity uh, being natural numbers. The reason we say zero is because if you input zero into this cosine here, you actually end up with one, which gives us t sub zero, um, as we said here. So we can just denote that with, in the case lambda greater than or equal to zero, um, we have these eigenvalues and these eigenfunctions. So now that we have these eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, we just use um, superposition again to remember that a single t sub n could be the sum of a cosine term and a sine term. And then they also have constants out front. So that's how we're going to write it. Um, and also just remembering that t sub zero is its own constant. So now we're ready to move on to the r equation. Uh, for r only, again, we uh, get the r onto the other side, we add it over, set it equal to zero. Um, in this case, we're going to guess r is equal to r to the p, and we bring it down to p equals plus or minus n, meaning that r is equal to uh, r raised to the plus or minus n. And this is going to give us, for any n value of one or higher, we've got cn r to the positive n plus dn r to the negative n. Again, this is a superposition of possible solutions. Um, but for the uh, r0 case, we have a constant plus, a constant times the natural log of r. Um, and again, because our radius is always going to be positive because it is a distance, it's a length, we don't have to add absolute value signs there. So we found uh, this solution and we're gonna use the boundary conditions. So we input r equals one, little r equals one. Um, and again, we can simplify the boundary condition to um, just focusing on r since theta can be any value. Um, so simplifying down, we find that um, r of one is going to give us zero, which is cn plus dn, because uh, if we input one here, then those are just going to be one, so it's cn plus dn, and that is equal to zero, cn is equal to negative dn, and what you end up finding then if you have negative dn here is that it's just cn factored out rn minus rn to the negative n. Then for r sub zero, uh, again, you input one, uh, the natural log of one is going to be zero, so that goes away. A zero zero, but we don't have any commentary on B zero, so we've just got R zero is B zero, natural log of R. And we aren't really worried about when R is equal to zero because we already defined the center, um, so we're just using this boundary condition for this case. So now that we have solutions for R sub n and T sub n, we can uh, multiply them together to find a uh, find our values for u. And so we've got any u sub zero is going to be u, r zero t zero. Remember the t zero is just a constant, so it's just b zero uh, natural log of r, as we had solved in the, the, the past time. And then u sub n is r sub n t sub n. Uh, we had a constant out front here, but I'm going to just put that into the a sub n here and into the b sub n here, so that we can keep uh, as few constants as possible. 
And then similarly, um, just a matter of notation, I'm going to transfer this B0 into an A0. It's the same thing, it's just a constant, but it is to, um, it is for simplicity's sake. And also because we'll go into a Fourier series later on, and so we're going to want that as an A0 just for notation. Um, so this is our, our superposition solution. And now we have to use our initial condition, or the boundary condition we wanted to ignore. Um, so it's a, a piecewise function based purely off of theta. Uh, between negative pi and 0, it's negative 15. Between 0 and pi, it's 15. And so with our initial condition, we've got f of theta equals uh, this, and we input beta for theta. So we've got natural log of beta. Um, again, we know that's going to be positive because beta, we assume, is greater than 1. And then we've got this term here. So now we want to determine what is a0, an, and bn. Well, we're going to use Fourier analysis. So just to remind you, um, if you forgot from last time, we can describe a function as being a constant plus a sum of a constant times a cosine and a cosine series and a constant times a sine series look like that, where our constants take these forms. So now, bringing this into our equation, we have the a0 natural log of beta, we have our cosine, and we have our sine series. So we can use this to solve for those constants. Um, one thing that we want to notice is that it's supposed to just be a constant here, but if we have an times this, well, this is actually just a constant because beta is a constant and is always going to have a specific value. So what we can say is then a sub n tilde is an times that, b sub n tilde is bn times that, and finally uh, a sub naught tilde is just a naught um, ln b. So that way what it turns it into is just... A uh, function is equal to constant plus constant front of cosine series plus constant front of sine series. So now we can use this for Fourier analysis. And one thing to remember though, the, the reason I wrote it as f of theta is to keep it simple. However, when we are integrating, f of theta will take a different value depending on whether we are going from negative pi to zero or zero to pi, uh, which is this difference between negative 15 or 15. So solving, we find um, this is how we set them up, but what it's going to end up being is just uh, these values. Um, I used software for it, so it simplifies it down a little bit, makes it a little bit faster, would suggest doing that as well. Um, so we found here that b sub n had this value, b sub n tilde, uh, but we want to find the actual b sub n without the tilde. So we said it was this, here with the b sub n is beta to the n minus beta to the negative n. Um, we can just divide by beta to the n minus beta to the negative n and we get b sub n is this whole thing here. Um, and this is also the Mathematica code. In case you're interested, you can pause the video. Um, this is just for setting up uh, those two. You could also use a piecewise function, but I found it easier to just create two separate integrals here. And then this is where we get the constants. So inputting that constant in and also recognizing that two of the constants are zero, we end up with 30 times uh, this <laughs> mess. Um, I pulled 30 out just so that we could leave it outside of the series. Um, but yeah, we get all of this. And beta is the length of your radius, so that's going to be just focusing these two here. And we also recognize that this is only when we're talking about radius uh, greater than 1, because we already defined a radius less than 1 is just going to have a temperature of 0 Celsius. So we're going to ignore that. Uh, it's not interesting. So I plotted this on Mathematica, and this is my code. Um, it's really good for coding uh, circular regions. Thank you to Professor Clifton for giving us this. And what it gives is um, this shape. And one note, we've got the heat here. Um, I did reduce it down to 1.5 for the top and 1.5 for the bottom simply to make it look better. Um, and then I set the radius equal to 3 centimeters. This is just an example of what you could do. 
Um, you could set the radius to anything, but I thought this was the most aesthetically pleasing. So do we like the plot? Uh, yeah, we've got heat at the top. It's at that maximum all the way around. And then we've got heat at the bottom. That's at the minimum all the way around from negative pi to zero, and then transferring up from zero to pi, it's that heat. Uh, we would expect there to be zero heat along the center line, just because that's where the cold is going to meet the hot, and so it should approximately cancel out. And then once again, we have the gap in the middle because we have that dowel. Um, our shape is a washer, so we don't have to worry about what's going on there. So. That's all. Um, now, you know, just as a summary, make sure you identify your PDE and boundary conditions. So that's what we did at the beginning. We just looked at the equation. We said, uh, what's the equation? What are the boundary conditions? And we set it up. Um, check for linear, linearity and homogeneity um, and to use separation of variables. Uh, so we had to consider one of our boundary conditions as an initial condition in order to use separation. And then you also may remember that when we saw inhomogeneity in the last problem, we had to split it into a transient and steady state solution. So that could also occur. So that's why we want to check for these two. Uh, we separate the solution. Then we solve each of the individual separated solutions, remembering that they are equal to a constant. Uh, we combine all the possible solutions using superposition, and then we're going to have some coefficients. And usually you're going to be able to use Fourier analysis to determine those coefficients. And so then just to make sure that you like what you see, you can use uh, software to show what the heat will look like. Um, this will usually give you a good idea of if you have the right equation, uh, because it should give something that makes sense. So good luck uh, solving the problem. Thanks for watching. And this is the Honor Pledge. Thanks.